Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Dr. James DC, and happy Monday to everyone. We haven't been on the air for about a week. We were on uh, assignment, doing some traveling, and uh, we're back. So lots been happening, as you well know. We're going to be talking um, about a lot of topics tonight. I have a great guest. He'll be here uh, in a few minutes. It's uh, Ken LaCourt who was a former Fox News executive uh, turned independent newsman. Uh, some great stories relative to Ken's experience and some of the things that he's done. He's an amazing activist uh, and he's, he's just got, he's going to have some great stories, I know, and I've got some, some questions for him. Uh, and then uh, we'll have a short break after we talk to Ken. Uh, and then I want to talk about some issues and stay with me in the second half of the show because I'm going to be talking to you about the coronavirus. Um, I have a lot of good information. Uh, as many of you know, I'm not a medical doctor. I am a PhD researcher, but I am also a licensed nurse practitioner, which is a very high level of practice. It's not uh, traditional nursing as you might know it. Uh, it's a limited practice of medicine in a specialty area. And it comes with all the privileges like prescribing and um, diagnosing and treating. So that's where I get my medical knowledge from. But I'm going to be talking about the coronavirus. I've got a lot of good information for you on it. I want to clarify some misunderstandings around this virus. It is not just the flu. Uh, and so, um, you know, we'll talk about what you can do to protect yourself, why it's really uh, more serious, and you have to be careful um, and in and, and what you're what you're doing and how you're protecting yourself. So we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, so some of the topics I'm going to be um, addressing after the break, after our interview with Ken LaCourt and the break, will be uh, these New York City police assassinations. And we're going to talk about some of the reasons behind them, some of the things that de Blasio and Cuomo have put in place that you may not be aware of that are part and parcel of this. He is definitely, de Blasio is definitely to blame. We're going to talk about um, genius Pete Buttigieg, Edge Edge, uh, his latest declaration that if he gets to be president, he's going to legalize all drugs. Okay, so we'll talk about that and what that means. When he says all drugs, yes, he means heroin. He means methamphetamines, cocaine, I mean, absolutely insane. We're going we're gonna to talk about it. I'm not going to get upset yet. I'm going to save it for later in the show. Um, we'll talk a little bit about some of the sideline antics of Nancy Pelosi. She's been off the chain. Uh, look, I, I'm, I don't like to diagnose somebody from afar, but I know when I'm seeing uh, a, a, like a cognitively challenged person, when someone can't find the right words, when they get emotionally upset and they uh, don't speak as coherently. And that's actually Nancy Pelosi and uh, Joe Biden. Okay, I'm watching our stream here, so I'm, I'm really hoping we're not having any major issues uh, tonight. We, as you know, I wanted to also introduce the fact that uh, we've, we've switched at TECN, we used to stream on the ENET channel. And ENET was a good experience uh, for us. Um, I don't know what the particulars are that's uh, between our founder and president, Ken McClinton, who is the exceptional conservative himself. Um, but uh, it, 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 it warranted a, a move and a change. And now the exceptional conservative news n network or network is independent. We are our own network, yay. And Dr. James DC, of course, moved over with the rest of our TECN family. I'm very excited. And uh, so uh, that's why I was saying I was watching our stream a little bit because it seemed to be flickering. Uh, we are connected, and it looks like it's all a go. I'm also, uh, look over to the left, I'm looking at another screen that monitors how we're coming across on TECN. So congratulations to us and to Ken McClinton for making this happen. We're really excited. And one other announcement I wanted to make was that we are going to officially 
be incorporating uh, a news show every day. I don't have all the details yet. We're fortunate enough and excited to have snagged uh, journalist Sandra Lee, who's going to be joining us, and she'll be doing the news every day. So we are going to be a full service network. I'm just really excited to be part of this. It's been Ken's vision, and I've been lucky to be part of it. Uh, we, will, we will also be at CPAC, by the way. I wanted to make mention of that. Uh, CPAC is from uh, February uh, 2026, 20, I think is day one, but I'm not sure that the conference really starts at Wednesday the 26th. Uh, but it is the 27th, 28th, and 29th. And we will be, when I say we, the Exceptional Conservative Network family will be uh, broadcasting live from CPAC. My show, Dr. Jane's DC, will be airing uh, both Thursday and Friday, February 27 and 28, from 6 p.m. till 9 p.m. And we are already lining up some great guests who are going to stop by. We're, we're going to make a little schedule so that um, you can get some summaries and some impressions of the day and some of the events that occurred. And we'll, we're, we're looking to uh, have some really special people, some famous people. I can't say the names yet. And some of them we're still talking to. So that's going to be really a lot of fun. CPAC. For those of you who have tickets or who would like to go in the D.C. area, CPAC will be at the National Harbor, the Gaylord National Harbor, across the Potomac River. Uh, and so it's a big place. I think there are still tickets available. Uh, let's hope this year, though, that CPAC doesn't bring any more self-avowed communists like they did last year. Sorry. Just, that was not a good move. Okay, could have brought in a lot of other people if they wanted to talk about prison reform instead of uh, a communist, Van Jones. That was despicable. And as he was leaving the building last year, I caught him and said, Hey, Van, are you still a communist? And he kind of sarcastically laughed and said, You'll have to watch my show. And I said, No way. But uh, somebody from CNN has that, that tape. I didn't have my phone camera on in that moment. I should have. Bad. Bad. Bad on me, the author of A Sea of New Media, which encourages all of you out there <coughs> to use your tool that you're never apart from and gather the news. We're, we're the news now because we're, we're the only ones left to tell the truth. We don't have a free press in the country. So there you have that. So CPAC. Look for us there. Ken will be broadcasting, I believe, 6 a.m. to 9 a.m., both Thursday and Friday, and I get the, I'm lucky enough to get the evening slot from 6 p.m. till 9 p.m. And then Ken and I will be doing some broadcasting together on Saturday. So we'll have, um, we'll have some fun, some fun things and people for you. Um, last year we talked to Sarah Carter. Um, we, we talked to a bunch of... Uh, a guess that were our semi-regulars on both Ken's show and mine. So that was fun. Uh, let's see. We are still waiting for Ken to come in. Uh, sometimes it takes a minute or two to get in. And let me just double check and make sure he's not having any difficulties. Okay, it looks like he's teeing up. So um, I'm going to bring him in. This is really exciting. Um, let me bring him up a little bit here. Let's see if we can. Uh, uh, I'm going to be introducing our next guest. I'm really excited to have him on the show. Uh, we'll see if he can hear me, but I want to I introduce him first. Um, Ken LaCourt is actually the founder of LaCourt News. With a motto of news unspun and talk uncensored, the site highlights media malfeasance, which I'm really looking forward to talking to him about, and Silicon Valley censorship. Ken was a, a senior executive at the Fox News Channel from 1998 to 2016, where for the last decade he headed the editorial team at foxnews.com. 
Ken, good evening and welcome to the show. Jane, it's good to be here. How are you? It's great. It's really great to have you on the good show. Uh, when I saw your name come up, um, I'll tell the folks this, I was really excited because I'm, you know, I'm interested in your background, everything you've accomplished, and so I'm really excited that you could join us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Ken, you know, I, I wanted you to maybe start out by, you know, giving folks a little bit of an overview of your time at Fox News, uh, just sort of a 30,000 foot, you know, just discussion of your experience. Sure. So I lucked out in life. My, my first real job outside of the college uh, little jobs I had was I moved to New York City to go to a, a graduate school. And uh, I got a job working for Roger Ailes, who had just oh, wow. signed on George Senior to run his uh, to run the media for his political campaign. And I worked with Roger for the next 30 years um, uh, on and off a little bit, main, mainly on. So flash forward, I'd actually moved back to California. He started up the Fox News Channel with uh, with Rupert Murdoch's money and encouragement and idea. They had a crazy notion and they said, we, we found a great niche, which is being completely underserved and it's half of America. And uh, and they realized that, that the, the biases and the media biases of, of CNN and MSNBC, which I guess really had it was was just ramping up a, a, around the same time, uh, and and we founded that, and I came in shortly after launch, and uh, and it was a, a very good good ride. Um, you know, we we believed, and I believe now that most of the media leans to the left, at least on the national scale. These days, I think it leans strongly, crazily to the left, and mm -hmm. and has gone kind of kind of a little off the rails, uh, and that started. I'd say before Trump, I'd say that started probably five or six years ago. And, uh, you know, we were, it was I was proud to be able to provide an alternative point of view to the mainstream media's kind of everybody thinks this same way. And of course, they all think the same way because they all live on Manhattan. They all vote for the same people they go to the same parties. And Fox News helped help break out of that. And, and, and that's why that's why you have people go crazy with with hatred on Fox. They're like, oh my God, how can you talk about Fox? And 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 it's like we were just one little little channel on on uh, on on cable, yet because it belied the notion that there was only one narrative, uh, it seemed to drive our our, our opponents crazy. And, well, uh, I I wanted to ask you a little bit more about because I think my theory is that everything you and Roger and you know that you all accomplished by setting Fox aside like that has been hijacked. And in fact, I wrote an article in 2017 about the Murdoch sons. And my theory was that, you know, like Rupert was smart enough to say, look, I'm liberal, but somebody's got to make some money with a conservative channel. But, but I, think the, conservative. I think the sons have hijacked he's a conservative it. Guy. I mean, he's a capitalist before he's a conservative. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he did all the boys, he didn't make any changes, but, too many changes to it, but he's pretty but conservative. What's your he's opinion kidding. on that? I mean, have the sons hijacked it? I mean, look, you've got all kinds of left wing, you know, pundits, show anchors. I mean, it's it's a psyop. So I think it's a, a little bit of a combination of a couple things. Um, um, he has two sons. Um, um, James is pretty is pretty left. And and uh, I think less so with Lachlan. And Lachlan's the guy who's I think more hands-on on running it. I think that some of the kids were a little embarrassed. You know, they go to the Academy Awards and Scarlett Johansson would be like, "Oh, you're you're Sean Hannity's boss," and roll her eyes at him. So I think there was a little bit of that wanting to be in the cool kids liberal club. Mm. Um, I'm not a crazy believer that Fox has gone on hard left or certainly anything anything to do that. I mean. I think that a couple things are at play. One is, you know, the prime timeline up there is still pretty darn conservative. I mean, back in the day, we had Hannity and Combs. We had mm -hmm. Greta Van Susteren, who was so conservative. We had, we had uh, Bill O'Reilly, who was uh, pretty conservative. I call him more of a populist, but mm -hmm. with strong conservative, conservative leanings. So in some ways, the channel is actually more conservative now than it has been. Hmm. We're also, though, finally attuned to this fight where, I mean, well, I don't know. How many lefties do you really see? I mean, Shepard Smith was there for years. He's not there. Tucker's pretty conservative. Laura Ingraham's conservative. Well, uh, Sean Hannity you, is Mr. You called it right for prime time. But I think that's a business decision because they can't turn their backs on that level of, of, of you know, ratings. No, right but that. I do you're see right a lot that. of lefties. I see them emerging and coming up more in front. Marie Harf. Juan, you know, Williams, um, 
Donna Brazil. Donna Brazil. We always <laughs> look. We had Roger hired. Roger hired, uh, uh, who was the gal who ran the Dukakis campaign uh, with, the, with the raspy voice. Uh, we always had oh. liberals on it. I think a couple things. One is, and, and, and you know, I mean, for years I had people who come up to me and they'd say, fire Geraldo, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, the Geraldo. And, and, and then we always kind of had our, our share of, of lefties on there as, 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 as well. And, and I actually think it was probably healthy for it. Two things are going on. One is we've become hyper more aware of that in the age right now because we're just, look, we are, we, and by we, I mean, us as Americans are just much more, concerned about that than we were shoot, even three or four years ago. The second, and I understand this, it's, you know, Fox News is, is you know, outside of OAN or a couple small little little places online or on, 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 the, on, the, uh, on, on the cable spectrum. Fox News is the only place where you can go and actually hear a conservative thought or hear that narrative without being mocked. And it's kind of, I understand people being nervous of it and they should be. It's, it's like we're in a desert and there's one well there with water. And when it's like, eh, the, the guys who own this don't necessarily like water. I, I, I totally understand conservatives being worried about Fox going going left. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think it's still 95.5, though. I mean, really, you know, I, I actually think it's okay to hear a Donna Brazil's point of view. I actually do believe you can hear all that. Where I look, the things that I'm uh, upset with Fox. They've kind of lost their mojo and 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 breaking good good news out there. Sometimes I think they've backed off. They were one of the, they were one of the outlets that, that refused to uh, to report the name of the the so-called whistleblower uh, who was really a CIA analyst working out of Langley that started right. there. So I, I've got issues with them, but you know they're a little too enabling. They're a little too enabling. Say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was going to say ahead. they're a little too enabling of the left, in my in my humble opinion. Sometimes, yeah, that's a fair argument. Yeah. That's a, that's yeah. a fair but argument. But I like hearing that's your your take on this. Let's switch gears a little bit. Um, if people look you up, uh, there are a lot of interesting things that you've been involved in, and I want to get to a couple of them. But I wanted to ask you about the you were accused, and I want people to understand the whole story of sort of sure, sure. initially burying the Stormy Daniels Trump story. You were accused right. by D Diana Falzone. And I wanted to give you a chance to explain that because I did read the whole thing on it. And it's interesting. Sure. I, I, I killed it. Um, um, it was it was in the last two weeks of, uh, of the presidential election. Uh, we had a story that that. So, so here's what happened. So Stormy Daniels, who I'm guessing had a had a had a thing with Donald Trump. You know, I, oops, hit my mic here. Um, mm -hmm. She had cut a deal with them to shut up and get some money. And coming in the last three, four weeks of the campaign, they were slow because, you know, they didn't want to violate the law. They were trying to figure out how do we do this legally without uh, without creating all sorts of problems. So Trump's lawyers were, were kind of figuring that they were, they were dragging their feet a little bit. So she's in a conundrum because she's like, look, everybody says this guy's going to lose on, on November 4th, right? I mean, nobody in America on TV or the Internet or T or print was saying Donald Trump could win. So she's like, if I don't get him to pay up that money by Election Day, I'm getting nothing. So she started leaking this story to a handful of outlets. It wasn't just Fox. It was it was some liberal ones. It was NBC. It was it was a handful of outlets. But she was in a weird thing, because if she told us the whole story, well, we'd print it maybe, and and then she wouldn't get her money for shutting up. So she had to kind of get it. So the game that she and her her people were playing was, let's get enough out here that we can say, oh, there's a story going on here, but not give so much that if we printed it, that then she wouldn't get her dough. So she kind of like leaked little things, and it was, clearly was no way, shape, or form something that I was going to print. Uh, uh, you know, two weeks before an election. And to be honest, it was like, oh, Donald Trump slept with a porn star 10 years ago. Uh, you know, <laughs> right. this was the time where he was being accused of rape by five women. He was being accused of all this stuff. All these people are coming out of the woodwork. To me, it was not a, a story. It was kind of like a B minus story. So we couldn't put it together. And then at one point, her team just went completely silent. Well, they got their dough. That's what happened. Uh, mm, you know, he decided right. for whatever reason pay off that. And then, of course, that became the first, you know, that that was the third reason why people should impeach him. I mean, I mean, the, the left right. was starting to write about impeachment. 
literally the first time I read a story about impeaching Donald Trump was the day he was sworn in as president in the in the Washington Post. They had a story on impeachment. Uh, you know, people right. people vied for impeachment. And it of course, started one from of the beginning was stormy. So yeah, it was no, kind of so silliness. Donald, look. Donald Trump is not a typical president. Um, 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 nobody kind of equates him in the uh, in, in in you know it, we're in a rough period of politics and and he's a rough and, and and hard player and and I think a lot of Republicans support him who might not have supported him in other years. But here we are. Right. Yeah. I mean, on the story, it was clear that you were making a a, a, a prudent journalistic decision, not you know any personal help to the president. So I, mean, I, Stormy, I just wanted you to Stormy wasn't talking to us. Yeah. Her manager just would say it's true off the record kind of wouldn't talk to us. It was just it was kind of dumb. Tell me a little bit more about your news organization that you started because it what I'm particularly interested in is you're you're focusing it. You even put it in your headlines um, and your your raison d'etre is to um, address media malfeasance and you know big tech censorship and they're actually you know they, they can overlap but they're actually two major focal points tell me about well, we're about that part in american history i mean the news in the late 1800s early 1900s the news didn't try to be fair and balanced to coin a phrase they tr they were they were partisan they were they you know you knew if you went to the sun you would get uh, a certain point of view you knew if you went to another paper you would get to a certain point of view that kind of changed in america and it started really with the new york times i mean they that uh, um adolph oaks was was a was a guy who brought in a whole sea change of that and the hearst papers and the whole yellow journalism kind of fell away to more 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 balanced journalism and we went through a period of probably 70 years in America where, and, and part of it was just economics. It was like, if you owned the LA Times or the New York Times, you were making money, you were doing well. You didn't have to strive really hard to get those extra clicks or those extra those extra viewers. If, if you owned NBC or CBS or ABC on, on the networks, that was like a license to print money. I mean, so literally mm. at that period, the, the, the news entities were kind of, they were a lost leader. NBC was making a trillion dollars a year and it was like, go out there and be fair. Well, economic times have changed. Newspapers mm -hmm. going out of business, um, um, TV, it's, it's much more competitive as it, as it ever was. And we're seeing kind of a return to the partisan press. Mm -hmm. And we're in a bizarre time right now because, well, two things. One is they're still pretending at the Washington Post and the New York Times to be, to be centrist, to be we're, mm -hmm. we're giving a fair and they're not they're being intellectually dishonest you you know cnn used to be they always lean to the left but they used to be an organization that, that wasn't actively i mean you how do i say if the democratic national convention was or uh, committee was 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 running cnn do you think mm -hmm. that their product would be all that different i mean Probably they might not they're doing well, it for them. I mean, yeah, they fire Juan Williams and they get rid of Chris Wallace and, uh, and two or three other, other so, people on there. So how is, how is La Court News going to be different? So what I've really come to realize is, is too many people are buying the notion that these entities are, are, are reporting in a, in a fair way. And so we spend a lot of time taking a look at yeah this isn't true this isn't just bias this is intellectual dishonesty and and we're seeing that routinely from from these major organizations mm. and you combine that with with the other part of it which is the growing censorship online that's getting very very scary to me because you know online used to be the way five years ago we said wow you can work around the the around the 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 national media the, the you know the so-called mainstream media and now we're seeing basically the Democrats are, are using the cancel culture concept as a way to diminish and, and remove thought online that, that, that they that they do. Absolutely. Want. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and it's, it's getting worse by the month. And it's yeah. something we're going to concern. I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, because there's been some pushback relative to, well, they're private companies and you don't have to use them. We had Alan Dershowitz on. I had him on the show a couple of weeks ago. And I said to him, you know, as a constitutional expert, 
um, when does the when do these companies that have so many people in them speaking become the public square? And he said that he he, he in his opinion he sees that it's becoming a common utility. So it's moving. What are your what's your view of how these you know Facebook, Twitter, are they becoming the you know common ground and should they be you know regulated from censoring? So, so look, I'm somebody who grew up as a small business person and all of that, and and it, and it, and it, it's a difficult position for me to say, hey, once you've become really, really successful, that we all get to then rip your company apart. I come at it from a little bit different point of view. I actually think that these companies are being unfairly protected by federal law, and that mm. those protections should be removed. And that that comes under two aspects. One is copyright law. And the other is Section 230 of the I think it's the FEC Communications Decency Act. And let me do a quick, quick overview on what those are. So yeah. Section 230 basically says, if you are the pipes, if you're not producing content, but you're just a platform, you should be not subject to libel laws and, and, and the things that are said on those platforms. Let me give you an example. If you and I are talking on the phone and we decided to either libel someone or commit a crime, Nobody's going to go sue Sprint because their lines were used for you and I to be nasty. And and that legal construct has been now given to to the uh, many of the online purveyors as well. Facebook, Twitter, mm -hmm. all of these. They are seen as as pipelines, not as content producers. Well, I think that's not 100% that that might have been fair and right a couple years ago, but now Facebook isn't just presenting the pipes and letting us all speak. They're saying, you're true, you can stay here. You're false, right. get off. You're kind of true, kind of false, we're moderating you. I believe that they're becoming more of, of, of news producers and should then, and that they have a choice to, that they should make. They should either say, we're pipes, say what you want to say. If you call that fake, you call that hate, whatever, do your thing and you guys can all fight it out here versus now they're saying, well, our fingers are in the pie and we're saying this is good, this is bad, this should be seen by more people. That to me changes those, that regulation. And, and, and I think that they should either be told to, okay, take your hands off and let everybody see this stuff going and you're not liable for it. But if you're now saying that's true, well, when Dr. Jane's out here committing libel, you should be liable for that because you're by, by, by effect mm. saying, saying mm -hmm. that's true. The other part is copyright laws are being used in a way that they were never meant to use. You write a book, you write Gone with the Wind, and the copyright laws say nobody should be able to copy that and, 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 and print that out. You should be able to profit from your work. Well, when you go put your pictures and, and comments on Facebook, did you really ever remember giving them the copyright, the copyright to those things to use it exclusively on their platform? Because the reason why you and I go to Facebook every day, well, I can't because they've banned me. The reason why you and other people, perhaps, go to go to Facebook every day isn't because they have your information. It's because they have all the information of your friends, your friends from mm -hmm. high school, your friends from college, mm -hmm. your your neighbors. And I can't come up with with Ken's book dot com and grab that information and use it because Facebook has 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 a legal ability to stop that. So. If I'm the government, I'm saying, okay, Mark Zuckerberg has created a, a, a great entity here. I don't want to break it up, but can he use the laws of us to, to basically maintain that monopoly? And that's where I say, no, I don't think he should. I think that if they're going to play that game, if they're going to be producers, they can't have it both ways. They can't keep all your information, profit from it, but then say, well, we have no responsibility for it. So that's kind of yeah. where I come down. No, I think that's really informative for people to, you know, I like your take on both of those those areas. And I think it's something that, you know, it's going to propel the discussion forward because things can't stay the way they are. I mean, we've all been victims of this censorship. I've had various, you know, time suspensions. Uh, my best friend is uh, Laura Loomer, if you know who she is. She's considered herself to be the most right. banned woman on the planet. She can't even I get Uber Eats or, you know. <laughs> What's that? I recall her chaining herself in front of buildings. Yes. Yes, and that live periscope was me for four hours down there. Right. Um, so trying to get the point across. So so you know we've all been victims of the banning. Um, 
you know, what is, what's your recommendation, you know, to the average person? Because the average person is starting to understand that we don't have a press like we all grew up with. So what do you tell the average citizen who just wants to, you know, have a chance to speak, maybe learn the truth, you know, get some real the news? What, what do they do? To make, sure to, look at, to make sure to look at multiple outlets. Because mm. we used to just be able to trust NBC or trust the New York Times. Again, you kind of knew they lay lean liberal, but you didn't know that they're doing what they do now. So that's that's one is it's really easy online to just go to another site, check out Fox, check out CNN, check out people whose judgments you trust out there. And and even then, you know, you're not may not get in the whole story. But I think that, that, look, the next five years, maybe a little bit more, conservatives are going to have to get into this fight and they're going to have to become activists. And, and look, the one thing, that, the one thing that, that Democrats have always done better than, than Republicans is they don't just fight the political fight. They fight upstream. And politics yes. and elections are downstream of the, the national press corps. They're downstream of, of, of movies and TVs and the values mm -hmm. that are propagated. They come downstream of, uh, you know, have you ever seen a kid come out of college more conservative than he or she went into it? They're downstream of education. And right. probably the right. only conservative, you know, uh, organization out there that is, that is, 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 is our churches and, 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 and your parents. And so, the, the conservatives need to start getting more into the news media. They need to start fighting those fights on college campuses more. They need to start start going to going to to and and, and using entertainment that that builds up their values as opposed to just just tears them down. So we both need to expose kind of what's going on with especially the liberal media, and, and then I think we yeah. need to start building up. Yeah, I like your suggestion. I mean, and we do have we do see some. Uh, conservatives trying and starting like Dennis Prager and Adam Carolla's new film and other films like that right. but, uh, and some things that Bannon has done in the past but as a matter of fact did you see that um, Barack Obama just got an, an Oscar for the movie did, on, did on unions but but this is but this is illustrating your point that that sure. you know, he's out of office and now God he's getting Emmys and Grammys and Oscars yeah. because he's producing yeah. still get a Art. Nobel Peace Prize yeah <laughs> right, right. Which he got his yeah. first week in office, or roughly, if I recall. Yeah, yeah, for just stepping into the office. Yeah. So no, your point is well, well taken, and I think, I think, uh, without being too judgmental, I, I personally think conservatives need to get up off their duffs a little bit more. They, they need to learn how to fight. Yeah, but we have an and, interesting. And, and, look, and, and and conservatives have kind of never really thought of the fight like this. And, and the first guy was he was a good friend of mine was uh, Andrew Breitbart was the first oh. one who kind of may, understood my thinking on that. Of uh, course. His father-in-law just passed away two days ago. Yeah, I saw that. People, a lot of people didn't know that Orson Bean was Andrew's father-in-law. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was really uh, tragic and strange. But anyway, yeah. I won't go too much into yeah, the conspiracy. So, so no, I, I think that um, um, you know conservatives need to start thinking in those terms. They need to stop stop believing everything that they read in the mainstream uh, the mainstream press because you know vox will write up something nasty about you and then the daily beast will pick it up it'll be solidified forever in, in wikipedia and people come to just wrong notions on things and yeah uh, absolutely and on all levels absolutely we really so we're, we're getting down to the last few minutes i just wanted to you know talk about your your website how can people find out more about it they might want to now that they they know you're there i mean if they're just learning tonight you know, can they support well, they it? Uh, they, they can't go to Facebook because literally if you try to forward up, uh, if you try to, I had three and a half million, 3.4 million followers on my very oh, Facebook Oh, wow. Page. They took, they that took hurts. One day. And literally if you try to forward up a link to a friend of yours, even even in the, in the uh, what do you call the little, uh, the behind the scenes, uh, the, the instant messaging to your friends, it'll oh, come the, up yeah. and say, oh, banned content. Uh, it violates oh. our things. So it's spelled L-A-C-O-R-T-E news.com. Um, um, we're going to be getting more, how do I say it? We're going to be getting more aggressive on not just reporting. I, I, I can't keep reporting every week and saying, wow, Zero Hedge just got pulled off of, uh, off of, off mm -hmm. of uh, Twitter, which they did last week. Or right. this site is disappearing. It's, it's more and more they are going after the smaller conservative voices and making those disappear, always through some ambiguous. Why ambiguous is that, Ken? Why are what? they going after the smaller conservative voices? You would think they'd try to hit the Charlie Kirks, 
the Jack Posobics with five, six hundred thousand followers. Yeah. Why aren't they those taking are the, down? Those are, those, those are the ones that they'll get to. I think that they want Fox News to be the only conservative voice out there, and that they want to zap out all of those, all of those moderate ones. And you know, how much of it is well thought out? I mean, look, I mean. You know, I live right outside of San Francisco. I'm I'm five minutes away from the Golden Gate Bridge. Twenty-five year old kids working for YouTube and 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 Facebook are deciding what we hear in America, and yeah. they're not really representative of American values. And the new look, the, this new tactic is being very very successful among the left. And look, there was a recent poll that said most college students. I think it was most. It was right around forty to fifty percent said that hate speech shouldn't be protected by the First Amendment. Well, what's that mean? If I say, oh, my gosh, you just put a model up wearing a who was wearing weighing 300 pounds and she was wearing a bikini as as, as, <laughs> as, as, as right. they just did in, in the New York Post. Is it hate speech to say I think that's unhealthy and we shouldn't celebrate that? I mean, so so these are the people who are are de determining the rules of, of the conversation mm -hmm. and it, whole cancel culture thing is is coming on strong and that's how they win arguments i mean nancy pelosi two days ago was telling facebook and twitter take down that ad that the trump campaign put up because right. it's right it's that was or, scary it was an edited ad of her ripping the things up and then it kind of showed what he said in the speech and then cut to her ripping it up and you know she was able to use i i think they said no to her although nbc did, did pull it out uh, that's yeah. how you play now, and and at least that's how that's how the left is playing is and and the that, disinformation, the yeah, and the disinformation. How she slipped in that you know that little thing about president. I think he was under the influence of drugs. Here's a guy who has n never drank, doesn't do drugs. I think if he had, if he was lying. Somebody would have found proof by now. And she's and she throws him. You know, it's like the left can't mean, but they can sure muddy somebody up. Look, and, 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 and canceling people and deplatforming them is, is an increasingly effective strategy. Yeah. And we're going to be left in the dregs if we don't start pushing back on that hard. Well, I'm glad you're in the fight doing it, Ken. And um, really, you've done some great work. And we didn't even get to all of the great things you've done, like helping to save your you know two correspondents that were kidnapped in Gaza. Come back and talk again. You, you definitely have to come back because I've got a I've got a nice list of incredible things that you've you've been involved in. So, uh, Lacourt News, everybody, LacourtNews.com, and you're still on Twitter for now. <laughs> well, I'm on Twitter for now, but I'm not I'm not counting it a long term. Well, we're we're we're, we're pulling for you. Well, oh, definitely Thank come you. back, Ken. Please. That'd be great. Thank you very. Thanks much. a lot. All right. Bye have bye. a great night. Hey guys, that was that was really wonderful. Um, what a great guest and a great opportunity to talk to to Ken. Um, he's he's just you got to look him up online and go to LaCourtNews.com. Um, he's one of those figures, you know, in terms of my, you know, I, I don't know everybody and I don't know everybody's histories. One of those great people that has has been very accomplished and has done a lot of things. And I, and I was serious. One of the things he did was he was instrumental in going to the Middle East and. Um, spearheading an effort to get the release of two uh, uh, Fox News correspondents who had been kidnapped in Gaza. So I want him to come back and tell us that story. Um, it's you know it's just an amazing story. And then uh, you know there's another story where he was you know the New York Times Times tried to muddy him up as some kind of you know under the influence of Russians. What else is new? They they always do that. And, and he's been very active in um, in California in getting sex offender registries in public so that people can be protected. Novel idea out there in California. Okay, let's get to a couple of uh, things that I want to I want to talk about. Uh, but first, because um, I want to share some information, especially on the coronavirus. So don't go away. Just going to take a quick, brief break, and we're going to see uh, just a little... Uh, we're not going to do both break videos because we went over with Ken. I just love talking to him so much, and I hope you did too. Uh, but let's go to a quick um, break. You'll still see Dr. Jane, and I'll be back in about two minutes.
everybody. This is Dr. Jane Ruby in Washington, D.C., author of A Sea of New Media. I wanted to tell you a little bit about this book because I was inspired to write it by Andrew Breitbart, who actually vindicated the Tea Party after they were falsely accused of calling three African-American congressional leaders the N-word, and nobody could come up with a video or an audio. So he told them weeks later and on the National Mall to hold up their cell phones, and thousands of people held up their cell phones, and you could see this beautiful in the night, and he said, there you have a sea of new media to capture the lies. Folks, we can't trust our mainstream media. We cannot trust our press. When you report fake news, which CNN does a lot, you are the enemy of the people. When President Trump says they're the enemy of the people, he's not being a dictator. He's telling the truth. They won't tell us the truth. But if we all have our cameras out in public, they can't lie if thousands of us are showing a video of something happening or not happening. So I encourage you to pick up a copy of the book. It's called A Sea of New Media. And if you think you don't can't make a difference, think about the guy who caught Hillary Clinton on tape, an average citizen caught Hillary Clinton being dragged into the van at the 9-11 memorial in 2016. We never would have known she was ill if it wasn't for that single individual citizen. Pick up a copy of A Sea of New Media on Amazon, and if you happen to see me around DC, I'll be happy to sign the book for you and give you a big hug. I'm on Facebook and Twitter, and I have a show in DC called Dr. Jane's DC, Tuesday and Thursday nights on the Exceptional Conservative Network. Please join me again. I'm Dr. Jane Ruby. See you next time. my audio back on. Thanks for coming back. A little break there. Um, so you missed the first half of the show. You can watch the replay on my Twitter and Periscope. And I've also resurrected my YouTube channel. And you'll find the shows uploaded within 24 hours to that channel. Believe it or not, it takes about a number of hours, sometimes three, four hours to upload because there's a lot of buffering and stuff that they do and they check it for you know anything that's um copyrighted and all that sort of thing music um but anyway you'll you'll find anything re you know you can watch replays after the show so i wanted to talk about a couple of topics that are really important the first is if you've watched my twitter feed in the last few days i'm just really uh, incensed over these police assassinations in new york city i mean you know what 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 did everybody expect um de blasio has literally set his police officers up to be assassinated in the way he got elected to office if you if you look back at, at how he came to to be elected he actually ran on a platform of anti-cop rhetoric it's, it's just despicable even in 2014 i think it was you, you may remember this, that, that he had to walk by hundreds of police officers and they turned their backs to him. I wanted to show you a tweet uh, that I saw by the Police Benevolent Association of New York City. This is just, uh, I'm, I'm just, I stand with this organization. I stand with every police officer everywhere, uh, especially the ones in New York City. But there are police officers being targeted across our entire nation, f folks. Um, so, so de Blasio does his usual, you know, oh yeah, it's terrible that the cops are, you know, he's just starting to speak up a little bit because he knows, he knows he's on his way out. He knows people are disgusted with him. And so he wrote this tweet that this was a premeditated assassination attempt against New York's finest. He's such a phony. And then he wrote, it was also an attack on all New Yorkers and everything we believe in. This must be a city where everyone can live in peace and respect. This individual attempted to destroy that. We will not let him win. Are you kidding me? This jerk sat silent while police officers were getting water and garbage dumped over them and, and essentially told them, through the police commissioner to stand down, I would have arrested every single one of those people, made an example of them, build more jails, while Northam in Virginia here is building more jails for, for, for law-abiding gun owners like myself to be put in jail if we don't give up our guns. This idiot's letting criminals in New York out on the street. And let me explain to you the bail reform law in New York. 
that our little buddy de Blasio and his, his uh, comrade, his communist comrade Andrew Cuomo, put into effect in New York. Look up the bail reform law that passed in New York. Uh, it limits a judge's ability to impose bail. This is a communist tactic, okay, of de Blasio and uh, Cuomo, because they don't want people who are, you know, under underprivileged, okay, uh, to have to pay bail. But if you look, you can look up online, look at the list of what the crimes are that come under the bail reform law where a judge's hands are tied and they cannot impose bail. Imposing bail puts, you know, requires the defendant to have some skin in the game. It prevents people from being a flight risk and it it limits their ability on a number of levels. It makes them think about re, you know, recommitting a crime. If you know you're not going to be um, arrested and or given bail a requirement, you'll just go to the next opportunity and commit a crime. So it's just it's just a, this is all a function, guys, of sanctuary cities. Sanctu New York is a sanctuary state almost, pretty much. I think it is. Um, crime is increasing. Let me go back to this tweet. Because this, the Police Benevolent Association has declared war on Bill de Blasio. By the way, that's not his real name. He's got some Wilhelm... Warner kind of name, which is interesting. Nobody ever asked him in the press, because we have no press, why he changed his name. What was he hiding from? What was he covering up? So the Police Benevolent Association said, Mayor de Blasio, <coughs> excuse me, the members of the New York Police Department are declaring war on you. We do not respect you. Do not visit us in hospitals. You sold the New York Police Department to the vile creatures, the 1% who hate cops but vote for you. New York Police Department cops have been assassinated because of you. This isn't over. Game on. Good for you. Good for you guys. I'm proud of them for doing that. And I'll tell you what. There was a another... Another one that they wrote, uh, because President Trump tweeted about it and said he lived in New York City all these years and you know never saw such disrespect toward the police. Um, so anyway, then the Police Benevolent Association wrote back and said, yes, President Trump's right. You can find it all on, on Twitter. But, I mean, it's got to stop, guys. This is getting really dangerous. Okay, next rant. This is Dr. Jane's rants. We got to do these. Um, and God, please, New York, please get to the polls. You know, New York's got some weird voting thing where you know you don't need a majority or something. But but overwhelm your your voting booths. And you know, when this guy's up, you know, and and Cuomo, get rid of these communists. Jeez, it's killing me. And we got our own stuff down here in D.C. and Virginia, but whatever. Um, Pete Buttigieg, edge edge. Okay, this little 12 year old who's running for office, who, you know, if you look at the city of South Bend, Indiana, where he's the mayor, uh, it's just a, it's a, it's a poop hole. I mean, it's just, a, it's a, it's a dump. And look at his track record. But anyway, he's having a little bit of a run this week in the caucuses. His latest thing is to, that he promises, I hope you're sitting down, to legalize all drugs are you out of your minds okay so i am a neuroscientist and a health economist and i'm published you can look it up on pubmed um this is the government run database for peer-reviewed journal articles and my work part of my work has been in cognitive um diseases like alzheimer's and depression and anxiety and a great deal of my t my tenure has also been in, in the area of research around opioid addiction and i heard greg gutfield make a really stupid i ordinarily like him but i heard him make a really stupid comment tonight on the five 
because he said, oh, I'm a libertarian and people should be able to, you know, people don't get, you know, um, hurt or overdose on legal narcotics. They do it on illegal. And if we don't have legal narcotics and legalized drugs, then people are going to, you know, just get more of it on the street. Oh, my God. Greg, no, no. Millions of people a day, in fact, the majority of people that are opioid addicted and sick because it's an illness are those who got hooked on prescription meds, prescription narcotics for maybe a, a surgical problem, post-op, a back injury, things like that. It's just really stupid. And has anybody met San Francisco lately? Have you seen the needles in the street? Have you seen the um, homeless people and just literal, I mean, people that are mentally ill, drug addicted, drug damaged mentally, shooting up in the streets? Have you, have you seen any of that lately? Why would you want to, you know, pro make that more pr prolific? It, it just blows my mind. Guy's an idiot. You, you just can't get any more left in the Democrat Party, the Communist Democrat Party. Uh, and as I told Ken LaCourt, I was just going to mention that, you know, Pelosi did that little thing where she slipped in that, you know, I, I think President Trump was, uh, I think he was on drugs and I think he was, you know, a little tipsy. The guy doesn't even drink alcohol. You know, she trots around D.C. You know, she's notorious for her, her vodka. She slurs. She's not even coherent when she's not drunk. Uh, it's just so dirty. It's getting so dirty. But I, I want to warn everybody, it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. And they think they're fighting for their lives. They, they don't understand this president has brought more prosperity and more, and more advances and made our country stronger. Yeah, could he do things in some other areas? Of course. Nobody can get it all done. Nobody's perfect. But the alternative would have been unthinkable. And it's just, uh, it's, it's going to be a real battle, folks, really a serious battle. Okay, I want to take a minute and I want to share something with you about Vindman. You know, the Vindman brothers. Uh, you know that Vindman, the famous Vindman, was a, a, a witness against President Trump in the impeachment House hearings. And both he and his brother were let go, thank God. And there are a lot of other people in the NSC that President Trump has to get rid of. Uh, read my two articles on my website, drjaneruby.com. Uh, the one article is uh, Trump loyalists need not apply, whatever happened to greatagain.gov. That was an article talking about how there was a concerted effort. Obama holdovers, tons of them. Anti-Trumpers, rhinos. Rhinos are, by definition, anti-Trumpers. Uh, in that article, I explain how loyalists and people, maybe like myself, who sent their resume in, I would love to work on health care for the president, health economics, um, that those that database was accidentally deleted. You know, like Hillary's emails accidentally disappeared. And then when I published that first article, you can read the second one that came out of it, because I started getting all kinds of calls from the agencies like agriculture and the treasury and all kinds of other agents, federal agencies from people saying, hey, I'm a loyalist. I worked on the campaign, but you know what? Um, what the, the Obama holdovers are still our managers and they're firing us left and right. So that one's called Trump loyalist, you're fired. So go to drjaneruby.com, read the articles. But Vindman was released this week and Perp walked out of the White House. And I understand his brother was relieved of his duties too but i just got to get this in because it's a it's a vet and listen to what he has to say oh shoot bear with me here guys i i just want you to hear this this is so cool um, I've got double screens going. Here you go. Howdy, liberal. Hey, I see you guys' heads popping because Vinman got fired today. I want to read something to you real quick, all right? This is Article 94 of the United States Code of Military Justice, UCMJ. 
It's what anybody in the military, any branch of the military has to live by. It just is. This is mutiny. Uh, all right? Mutiny, just for the record. What Vindman did. to usurp or override lawful military authority, commander-in-chief, refuse in concert with any other person, he was working with someone else, to obey orders or otherwise do his duty or creates any violence or disturbance. He created an impeachment. Is guilty of mutiny. So understand something. Not only did this man sit on the National Security Council, a place that he should no longer be, number one. Number two, his brother had to go as well. And number three, they're lucky that they haven't been locked and taken onto a base somewhere and stuck in the brig and, and had Article 94 pressed against them. And I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised to see, I would, I would think if the military is anything uh, that's not part, partisan itself, they should be looking at this as an, a violation of Article 94, the, you know, the Uniform Code of Military Justice, period. There's no other way you can look at it. This man worked for the President of the United States as a member of the military. So that means that his direct chain of command went right through the Pentagon, right up to the President, just like if he worked anywhere else in the military, except he happened to work in the White House. Only difference. He ended up telling and admitting under oath that he told Ukraine's officials to ignore what his commander in chief had told them. That is mutiny. That is overriding military authority. That is overriding the president. Commander in chief. Period. A lieutenant colonel field grade officer thought he was smarter than the president and that his policies dictated to him from the State Department, I assume, from Obama, still took precedent no matter what this man said. That is mutiny. You don't have to be on a ship for it either. It goes all throughout the military. So while you're feeling sorry for this man, you just remember, he's a traitor. Better believe it. Thank you, soldier. That was awesome. Okay. Uh, in the interest of time, because we only have two minutes before you are going to see the most wonderful Ken McClinton and the Exceptional Conservative show coming up, I want to talk a little bit about the coronavirus because I want to make you a little smarter, as my friend uh, Lee Stranahan always says. I want to make you a little smarter. This is not just the normal flu, not just another flu. Why is it dangerous? For a couple of reasons. First of all, there's a two-week incubation, incubation period. Normal, what that means is the time before, between when you're first exposed, and you know this from a cold, you, you might be around somebody with a cold, and then two or three days later, you start getting sniffly and sick, sore throat. That's the incubation period. Time to exposure to time to first symptoms. The, the incubation period is two weeks for this virus, flu, the coronavirus flu. That makes it really dangerous because you could be exposed to a lot of people who look well and then you, before you even know you've been hit with it. Second reason it's really dangerous and not just the average flu. There was an article published, in a, an emergency article in The Lancet, one of the most preeminent peer-reviewed journals in medicine on the planet. And in that article, they explained that over 50%, well over 50% of patients who get this flu get what's called a double infiltrate. You know, your lungs, you have two sides. Okay, you have two, you have multiple lobes, but you have two sides. And it fill, they're, they're infiltrated with fluid. That's pneumonia. But you get a double infiltrate, which is why if you see at the end of all the symptoms, you know, malaise, sore throat, fever, and you see difficulty breathing. Difficulty breathing is not normally a symptom that goes with the flu, but it does with this one. What can you do? Be aware. Learn about it. Wash your hands constantly. Use hand sanitizer when you come in from the outside. The virus lives for hours, even dry. Very unusual, another thing that makes it dangerous. So look at my Twitter. I'll keep you up to date. We're up on the hour. This is Dr. Jane saying good night. Be safe from your nation's capital. See you Wednesday night. Tom Satterley, command major, uh, wrote the book All Secure. And we have Brigadier General Rob uh, Spaulding on Wednesday night. Don't miss it. Bye, guys. See you soon.